Good morning, Pray First. It is an honor to be here with you. It is Monday morning again. It's crazy how that just rolls around every single week. I hope that you are having a fantastic day this morning. And I'm going to wait just a minute. Hopefully this is working because it doesn't look like anyone is in here. And there is somebody. Hello, Leanne. People are starting to pop in here. Come on in. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let me know that you're here by saying hello. Hey, Sarah Taylor. Good morning, good morning. How are you guys doing? Hey, Kareem. Anyway, so it is 7 o'clock, top of the hour on Monday morning. Hey, Juanita. Hey, Neil. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, we are continuing to read through the Bible, and we uh, are going to be reading 1 Kings 9 this morning. I'm pretty sure that's where we left off. Hey, Court, how are you, beautiful? Thank you so much for saying I'm beautiful because I don't feel like it this morning. I'm telling you, I'm still recuperating from a fantastic weekend for the women's uh, retreat. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Brooke. Hey, Chris. How are your hands? Um, hey, Donna. So good. I think everybody's coming in now. <clears throat> so glad. <clears throat> hey, hey, Miss Joy. Oh, my goodness. Hashtag live if you're here at the 7 o'clock hour. Hashtag recorded. Hey, Randall, if you're here at any other time. Any other time. And I said time. That's how we say it in East Tennessee. We don't say time. Anyway, but we did have an amazing weekend. Um, there were um, right around 60 ladies with us this weekend. Morning, Miss Deborah. Um, and we had a great time just getting renewed and refreshed and spending some time um, with ladies and um, with the Lord. So it was really awesome. All right, well, <clears throat> I'm going to set my timer. And I'm going to get another quick drink of my coffee. Do you have your coffee? Are you a coffee drinker? Some of y'all are amazing people and don't have to have coffee. I like it, but I need it. <laughs> All right. One more thing. Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays, we come to you here on the Pastor Doug page at 7 o'clock in the morning to read with you, hopefully you have your Bible, um, the message version, and we are in 1 Kings. We have been reading the entire Bible, and don't forget, you guys, and some of y'all are, this will be new information, we have already read Proverbs and the Psalms, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. So, we will be skipping those momentarily when we get through these next few chapters. <laughs> That's a little joke this morning at 7 a.m. because there's a lot to it, all right? Okay, here we go. I've set my timer. 1 Kings 9. After Solomon had completed building the temple of God in his own palace, all the projects he had set his heart on doing, God appeared to Solomon again, just as he had appeared to him at Gideon. And God said to him, I've listened to and received all your prayers, your ever so passionate prayers. I've sanctified this temple that you have built. My name is stamped on it forever. My eyes are on it and my heart in it always. As for you, if you live in my presence as your father David lived, pure in heart and action, living the life I've set out for you, attentively obedient to my guidance and judgments, then I'll back your kingly rule over Israel. Make it a sure thing on a solid foundation. The same guarantee I gave David your father, I'm giving you. You can count on always having a descendant on Israel's throne. But if you or your sons betray me, ignoring my guidance and judgments, taking up the alien gods by serving and worshiping them, then the guarantee is off. I'll wipe Israel right off the map and repudiate this temple I've just sanctified to honor my name, and Israel will become nothing but a bad joke among the peoples of the world. And this temple, splendid as it is now, will become an object of contempt. Visitors will shake their heads saying, whatever happened here? What's the story behind these ruins? Then they'll be told the people who used to live here betrayed their God, the very God who rescued their ancestors from Egypt, 
They took up the with alien gods, worshiping and serving them. That's what's behind the God visited devastation. Yikes. At the end of 20 years, having built the two buildings, the temple of God and his personal palace, Solomon rewarded Hiram, king of Tyre, with a gift of 20 villages in the district of Galilee. Hiram had provided him with all the cedar and cypress and gold that he had wanted. But when Hiram left Tyre to look over the villages that Solomon had given him, he didn't like what he saw. He said, what kind of reward is this, my friend? 20 backwoods, hick towns? People still refer to them that way. This is all Hiram got from Solomon in exchange for four and a half tons of gold. All right, this is the work record of the labor force that King Solomon raised to build the temple of God. His palace, the defense complex, the Milo, the Jerusalem wall, and the fortified cities of Hazer, Megiddo, and Gezer. Gezer. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had come up and captured Gezer, to torched it, and killed all the Canaanites who lived there. He gave it as a wedding present to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer. He also built Lower Beth Horon, Baalath, and Tamar in the desert. Back country storehouse villages and villages for chariots and horses. Solomon built widely and extravagantly in Jerusalem and in Lebanon and wherever he fancied. The remnants from the original inhabitants of the land, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jambusites, all non-Israelites. Survivors of the holy wars were rounded up by Solomon for his gangs of slave labor, a policy still in effect. But true Israelites were not treated this way. They were used in his army and administration, government leaders and commanders of his chariots and charioteers. They were also the project managers responsible for Solomon's building operations, 550 of them in charge of the workforce. It was Pharaoh's daughter ceremonially ascended, it was after Pharaoh's daughter ceremonially ascended from the city of David and took up residence in a house built especially for her that Solomon built the defense complex, the Milo. Three times a year, Solomon worshipped at the altar of God, sacrificing whole burnt offerings and peace offerings and burning incense in the presence of God. Everything that had to do with the temple, he did generously and well. He didn't skimp. And ships. King Solomon also built ships at Ezion Geber, located near Elath in Edom on the Red Sea. Hiram sent seaworthy sailors to assist Solomon's men with the fleet. They embarked for e Ophir, brought si back 16 tons of gold, and presented it to King Solomon. Wow. Chapter 10. The Queen of Sheba heard about Solomon and his connection with the name of God. She came to put his reputation to the test by asking tough questions. She made a grand and showy entrance into Jerusalem, camels loaded with spices, a huge amount of gold and precious gems. She came to Solomon and talked about all the things that she cared about, emptying her heart to him. Solomon answered everything she put to him. Nothing stumped him. When the Queen of Sheba experienced her, for herself Solomon's wisdom and saw with her own eyes the palace he had built, the meals that were served, the impressive array of court officials and sharply dressed waiters, the lavish crystal, and the elaborate the lavish crystal and the elaborate worship extravagant with whole burnt offerings at, at the steps leading up to the temple of God, it took her breath away. She said to the king, it's all true. Your reputation for accomplishment and wisdom has reached all the way to my country is confirmed. I wouldn't have believed it, believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. They didn't exaggerate. Some wisdom and elegance, far more than I could ever have imagined. Lucky, the men and women who work for you, getting to be around you every day and hear your wise words firsthand. And blessed be God, your God, who took such a liking to you and made you king. Clearly, God's love for Israel is behind this. Making you king to keep a just order and nurture a God-pleasing people. So then gave, she then gave the king four and a half tons of gold and also sack after sack of spices and expensive gems. There, wasn't, there hasn't been a cargo of spices like that since the shipload the Queen of Sheba brought to King Solomon. The ships of Hiram also imported gold from Ophir, along with tremendous loads of fragrant sandalwood. Oh, that stuff smells good. And expensive gems. The king used the sandalwood for fine cabinetry in the Temple of God and the palace complex and for making harps and dulcimers for the musicians. Nothing like that shipment of sandalwood has been, has been 
seen since. King Solomon, for his part, gave the Queen of Sheba all her heart's desire, everything she asked for, on top of what she had already so generously given, he had already given her. Satisfied, she returned home with her train of servants. Solomon received 25 tons of gold to, do, to tribute annually. This was above and beyond the taxes and profit on trade with merchants and assorted kings and governors. King Solomon crafted 200 body-length shields of hammered gold, seven and a half pounds of gold to each shield, and 300 smaller shields about half that size. He stored the shields in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king built a massive throne of ivory, ascended with a... Oh, accented. <laughs> I'll get it in a minute. Accented with a veneer of gold. The throne had six steps leading up to it. Its back shaped like an arch. The armrests on each side were flanked by lions. Lions. Twelve of them were placed at either end of the six steps. There was no throne like it in any of the surrounding kingdoms. King Solomon's chalices and tankards were made of gold, and all the dinnerware and serving utensils in the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver. Silver was, silver was considered common and cheap. Wow. The king had a fleet of ocean going. The king had a fleet of ocean going ships at sea with Hiram's ships. Every three years, the fleet would bring in a cargo of gold, silver and ivory, and apes and peacocks. King Solomon was wiser and richer than all the kings of the earth. He surpassed them all. People came from all over the world to be with Solomon and drink in, the, drink in the wisdom God had given him, and everyone who came brought gifts. Artifacts of gold and silver, fashionable robes and gowns, the latest in weapons, exotic spices, and horses and mules. Parades of visitors year after year. Solomon collected chariots and horses, 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stabled them in the special chariot cities as well as in Jer Jerusalem. The king made silver as common as rocks and cedar as common as the fig trees in the lowland hills. His horses were brought in from Egypt and Silica, especially acquired by the king's agents. Chariots from Egypt went to fifteen went for fifteen pounds of silver and a horse for about three and three quarters pounds of silver. Solomon carried on a brisk carried on a brisk horse trading business with the Hittite and the Armenian Aramean royal houses. Chapter 11. King Solomon was obsessed with women. Pharaoh's daughter was only the first of the many foreign women he loved. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite. He took them from the surrounding pagan nations of which God had clearly warned Israel, you must not marry them, they'll seduce you into infatuations with their gods. Solomon fell in love with them anyway, refusing to give them up. He had several hundred royal wives and three hundred concubines, a thousand women in all. And they did seduce him away from God. As Solomon grew older, his wives beguiled him with their alien gods, and he became unfaithful. He didn't stay true to his God as his father David had done. Solomon took up with Ashtoreth, the whore goddess of the Sidians, and Molech, the horrible god of the Ammonites. Solomon openly defied God. He did not follow in his father's footsteps, in David's footsteps. He went on to build a sacred shrine to Chemosh, the horrible god of Moab, and to Molech, the horrible god of the Ammonites, on a hill just east of Jerusalem. He built similar shrines for all his foreign wives, who then polluted the countryside with the smoke and stench of their sacrifices. God was furious with Solomon for abandoning the God of Israel, the God who had twice appeared to him and had so clearly commanded him not to fool around with other gods. Solomon faith, faithlessly disobeyed God's orders. God said to Solomon, since this, is the way, since this is the way it is with you, that you have no intention of keeping faith with me and, going what, and doing what I have commanded, I'm going to rip the kingdom from you and hand it over to someone else. But out of respect for your father David, I won't do it in your lifetime. It's your son who will pay. I'll rip it out of his grasp. Even then, I won't take it all. I'll leave him one tribe in honor of my servant David and out of respect for my chosen city, Jerusalem. Can anybody tell me which tribe? God incited Hadad, a descendant of the king of Edom, into hostile actions against Solomon. Years earlier, when David devastated Edom, Joab, commander of the army, on his way to bury the dead, massacred all the men of Edom. 
<clears throat> excuse me, Joab and his army stayed there for six months, making sure they had killed every man in Edom. Hadad, just a boy at the time, had escaped with some of the Edomites who had worked for his father. Their escape route took them through Midian to Paran. They picked up some men in Paran and went on to Egypt. And to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, he gave Hadad a house, food, and even land. Pharaoh liked him so well that he gave him the sister of his wife, Queen Topinus, Topinus? Okay. in marriage. She bore Hadad a son named Ganubath, who was raised like one of the royal family. Ganubath grew up in the palace with Pharaoh's children. While living in Egypt, Hadad heard that both David and Joab, commander of the army, were dead. He approached Pharaoh and said, Send me off with your blessing. I want to return to my country. But why, said Pharaoh, why would you want to leave here? Hasn't everything been to your liking? Everything has been just fine, said Hadad, but I want to go home. Give me a good send-off. Then God incited another adversary against Solomon, Rezin, son of Eli Eliada, Eliada, who had deserted from his master, Hadadazer, king of Zobah. After David's slaughter of the Armenians, Rezin collected a band of outlaws and became their leader. They later settled in Damascus, where Rezin eventually took over as king. And like Hadad, Rezin was a thorn in Israel's side all of Solomon's life. He was king over Aram, and he hated Israel. And then, the last straw, Jeroboam, son of Nebuch, rebelled against the king. He was the Ephraimite from Zeradah. His mother, a widow named Zeruah, he served in Solomon's administration. This is why he rebelled. Solomon had built the outer defense system, the Milo, and had restored the fortifications that were in disrepair from the time of his father David. Jeroboam stood out during the construction as strong and able. When Solomon observed what a good worker he was, he put the young man in charge of the entire workforce of the tribe of Joseph. One day, Jeroboam was walking down the road of Jerusalem, Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, wearing a brand new cloak, met him. The two of them were alone on that remote stretch of road. Ahijah took off the new cloak that he was wearing and ripped it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take 10 of these pieces for yourself. This is by order of the God of Israel. See what I'm doing. I'm ripping the kingdom out of Solomon's hands and giving you 10 of the tribes. In honor of my servant David and out of respect for Jerusalem, the city I especially chose, he will get one tribe. And here's the reason. He faithlessly abandoned me and went off worshiping Ashtoreth, goddess of the Sidian, Sid, Sidonians, Chemosh or Chemosh, king of the Moabites, and Molech, god of the Ammonites. He hasn't lived the way I have shown him, hasn't done what I have wanted, and hasn't followed directions or obeyed orders as his father David did. Still, I won't take the whole kingdom away from him. I'll stick with him through his lifetime because of my servant David, whom I chose and who did follow my directions and obey my orders. But after that, I'll remove the kingdom from his son's control and give you ten tribes. I'll leave one tribe to his son to maintain a witness to my servant David in Jerusalem, the city I chose as a memorial to my name. But I have taken you in hand, rule to your heart's content." You are to be the king of Israel. If you listen to what I tell you and live the way I show you and do what pleases me, following directions and obeying orders as my servant David did, I'll stick with you no matter what. I'll build you a kingdom as solid as the one I built for David. Israel will be yours. I am bringing pain and trouble on your I am bringing pain and trouble on David's descendants, but the trials won't last forever. Solomon ordered the assassination of Jeroboam, but he got away to Egypt and found asylum there with King Shishak. He remained in exile there until Solomon died. The rest of Solomon's life and rule, his work and his wisdom, you can read for yourself in the Chronicles of Solomon. Solomon ruled in Jerusalem over all for 40 years. He died and was buried in the city of David, his father. His son Rehoboam was the next king. And we will stop there. How does one even know a thousand wives. I'm just going to say that. And 300 concubines. Good gravy. That's a small town. <laughs> That's a small little town. My goodness. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. And I hope that you... Um, ooh, we had a storm last night. I woke up several times with all that thunder 
um, going on. Did y'all have a lot of rain and thunder and, and there was a little bit of lightning, but I can't see a whole lot of that with my eyes closed, but I can still hear. I was trying, whoo, my goodness. So anyway, yes, exactly, Cor Courtney. I mean, that is, that is exactly right. That's exactly right. Power and money and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right. Well, I, um, hope that, um, y'all tune in tomorrow for the next chapter of first Kings 12. That's where, um, uh, pastor Dennis should start tomorrow unless, um, there's a switch up with, um, you know, cause I was here Friday and I was here today. So anyway, we do that. We like to keep it fresh around here and keep you guys guessing. But anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, um, if we're smart, we'll learn from others' mistakes or others' um, learning lessons and not have to learn them on our own. Um, and we'll evaluate our own experiences so that we learn not to repeat our, our own mistakes, God. Um, Father, um, I just love you and I just thank you so much for all that you do for all of us how faithful you are, and I keep saying, it's like this new thing that I keep saying, you're not just a promise maker, you are a promise keeper, and the more we lean in to you, and the more we trust you with our own life, and um, the lives of those that we love, the more we can see that your faithfulness, it's just there's not even words. We can't even verbalize how amazing you are. And um, thank you so much that you are in the small things and that you go before us, walk beside us, and have cleared a path so that we can be a light for you in the dark places, God. Help us to have eyes to see those that need to be seen today, God. And help us to um, be the salt and the light, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hashtag live, hashtag recorded, hashtag shared, um, whichever one applies to you. And thank you so much for the hearts and likes, letting people know that they are welcome here. And um, just have a great day. I'd love to give you a quick praise update. Um, I am walking very well now. Um, yesterday especially, um, I have almost lost my little shuffle type gait that I have had since back surgery a month ago. And, um, I give all the glory to the Lord and, um, for giving the wisdom, also for giving the wisdom and the, um, know how to my, um, um, skillful surgeon. And, um, I just want to thank all of you for the prayers because I know, um, that is the reason. So um, I'm still waiting on my complete paralysis or numbness, I should say, to wake up. But I will take every little step um, gladly that I can walk and do the things I need to do. So thank you so much for all your prayers. I want to give you an update on that. I am doing very well. Um, and um, I can go up steps. That's a huge one for me. I couldn't do that. But I went up like 10 steps this morning, which slowly but surely. But y'all have a wonderful day, and I can't wait to see you. I missed you guys that weren't at the women's retreat, um, and um, I ha can't wait to see you guys this week. And um, I'm trying to think. Oh, ladies, mark your calendar for the third um, Saturday in May. We will have Miss Candy Warren with us, and I'm super excited to hear what she has to share with us. And um, y'all have an amazing day. I know I've said that several times, but make it a good one. Talk to you later. Love you.